For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you would like to support the channel and become part of our ancient history fan community, visit patreon.com slash world of antiquity. Welcome to the Antiquities Travel Guide. Follow us to different countries as we search for ancient artifacts. If you too wish to explore the ancient past through travel, we'll help you plan where to go, what to see, and how best to enjoy what you encounter. In this series of the ATG, you can accompany Cassie and me on our trek through the Yucatan Peninsula, homeland of the ancient Maya. Come on, let's go. After visiting the fascinating sites of Zibanche and Knichna, which, if you haven't seen, is in our previous episode, Cassie and I headed east on the 186 toward the city of Chetumal, Mexico, which sits right near the border with Belize. That's right, we're going into Belize today. But before that, I wanted to visit the Museum of Mayan Culture in the city and check out some of the artifacts. The museum is open every day except Mondays. For foreigners like us, the cost is about 106 Mexican pesos, that's about 435 US. The museum has three levels set around a yashche or ceiba tree, sacred to the Maya. You start out on the middle level, which is designed like the jungle, with an atmosphere based on real sounds of animals from the region. There you can tour through the world of the daily life of the ancient Maya. The level below represents the underworld, and the one above, the celestial vault. The museum is not large, and it has a limited collection, so you can go through it in about a half hour to 45 minutes. We weren't allowed to take our car rental across the border. There was no car rental company in Merida that would allow this, so expect that. As a consequence, we had to leave our car at a car park in Chetumal. Conveniently, there are a couple of car rental services in Corozal, Belize. I called Belize VIP Auto Rental. They'll come pick you up and give you a ride across the border to their office. They'll even help you in getting through customs so that you know what to do and don't get confused. In case you don't know, and we didn't know, there is a departure fee. Yeah, you have to pay to leave Mexico. The cost is 550 pesos for each person. That's about 25 bucks each. By the way, there's also an exit fee for leaving Belize, and we had to pay that on the way back. All right, Dave, we just entered Belize. We made it. Yeah, we are leaving. It wasn't Custom. completely painless, but we made it. <laughs> yeah. Now, it just so happened that VIP Auto Rental was out of cars that day but they referred us to a neighboring car rental service, the only other one in Corozal, I believe. There are no chains in the region. They're called Carolina Auto Rental. We got a Ford Explorer from them, which we used the entire time that we were in Belize. It's family owned and operated. Their daughter Kimberly hooked us up. Thanks, Kim. They were very friendly and helpful and reasonably priced. The vehicles aren't new, so you won't have to worry about detailed inspections and paying for nicks. I recommend them highly. From there, we drove to Orange Walk Town and had a supper at a great little restaurant called Cocina Sabor. The staff was friendly and the food was delicious. We had our first opportunity to sample Belizean fare. I had the Belizean chicken. It was amazing. Cassie had vegetarian fajitas. They have Wi-Fi, and this was the first time we've had a decent connection for the past few days. I started backing up my videos to the cloud right in the restaurant. If you're ever in Orange Walk Town, visit Cocina Sabor. We stayed the night at Lamanai Landings, which sits right on the New River. It was pleasant enough, though not as upscale as the photos might lead you to believe. The Wi-Fi at the hotel worked far less well than the Wi-Fi at the restaurant. Lamanai lies along the west bank of the New River Lagoon, a long lake formed by the river. Its name, Lamanai, which means submerged crocodile, may be original. It was first settled in the early pre-classic, about 1800 BCE and was not abandoned until the late 1600s CE, making it one of the oldest continuously inhabited sites in the Maya world. The most popular way of getting to the site is to take a water taxi from Orange Walk Town or from the Tower Hill toll bridge near where we stayed. This is usually a four hour tour. For sake of time, we drove. If you come during the rainy season, I recommend four wheel drive. It's a dirt road almost all the way. Fortunately, we came during dry season, so conditions were good. <laughs> I mean comparatively good. 
The road took us through Mennonite territory. From what I understand, they came here in the 1950s and are of Russian descent, though they came from Canada through Mexico. The drive will take longer than your GPS tells you. This archaeological park is 860 acres, the second largest in Belize. There are more than 700 structures that have been mapped, but only the main ceremonial buildings have been restored. The others, which are overgrown by the rainforest, can still be seen if you follow the trails. We kind of stayed near the center. The cost is 10 Belizean dollars. Converting to US is super easy. You just divide it in half, so five bucks. By the way, that's the standard conversion rate throughout the country. Everybody accepts that. There's a visitor center on site with restrooms and you can buy food and drink. The city's location on the New River made it ideal as a trading hub. There's evidence of an ancient harbor at the northern end. We know they dealt in obsidian, jade, and cinnabar, which came down from the highlands to the west, and salt, honey, and cacao, which made its way here from the coast. There are three main groups of buildings at Lamanai, each set around a plaza. These represent the ceremonial core of the city. And then spreading out in all directions are other smaller clusters of buildings and residences. The Temple of the Jaguar is located in the southern complex. This pyramid is about 96 feet tall, on either side of the central stairway are two jaguar masks. Only the front of this structure has been fully restored. In the central complex, on the east fringe of the plaza, is the Temple of the Stila. In front of this structure, Stila 9 was discovered. The one here outside is a replica. The real one is in the site museum. Here it is. The Stila commemorates an event during the reign of Smoking Shell on March 10th, 625 CE. You can see the king holding a ceremonial bar across his chest, and the sun god is depicted on his breast. How well can scholars read Mayan hieroglyphics? Well, a lot better than they used to. The meanings of many of the signs are known, but the exact pronunciation of the words, maybe about half. Mayan writing is neither wholly phonetic nor wholly semantic, but a mixture of the two. In other words, the signs can convey pronunciation or meaning. Phonetically, we've found that much of it is syllabic. That is, a sign represents a syllable, usually a consonant followed by a vowel. But there is some inefficiency, an extra written vowel at the end of the word that's not supposed to be pronounced, for example. And there are logograms that have only semantic meaning and can be interpreted in more than one way. So they would use phonetic complements to these logograms, a sign attached to it, to show the correct pronunciation and therefore the correct meaning of the logogram. Mayan is read from right to left and from top to bottom, but signs are also placed on top of one another. So we might only see a part of the sign, the rest of it being underneath the other symbols. So you really have to know your signs to be able to identify it when you see only a piece of it. We know enough about the language of the inscriptions now to be able to identify it. It's a branch of the Maya language, now extinct, called Cholti and it appears to have been used as a literary language throughout Maya civilization, regardless of the dialect that was spoken in everyday life. Beneath the Stila platform base, a number of offerings were found, along with the skeletons of several children. Why they are there, we can only guess. The remains of a rather small ball court can be found. It has a late date, about 10th century, but what makes it particularly interesting is what was found here. Various offerings were discovered, they found a ceramic vessel, and when they opened up the lid, they found all kinds of miniature vessels, all floating in a pool of mercury. That's the first time mercury had ever been discovered in the Maya lowlands. A large circular altar was discovered in the central plaza too. Unfortunately, it's too badly eroded to be able to read it. Lamanai's earliest monumental architecture, mainly just platforms with wooden structures on top, appeared in the late pre-classic between 300 BCE and 200 CE. Once we get into the early classic, 200 to 600 CE, larger masonry structures appeared. The high temple. Most of the architecture that you see today is from the early classic through to the post-classic period with some modifications taking place even as late as the 1400s. That means Lamanai was a flourishing city 
even when many of the other classic Aramaya sites were going into decline. So this is the High Temple or Great Temple. Uh, it's the tallest pyramid in Lamanai. It's about 108 feet high, which would make it equivalent to about a 10-story building. It was built in several phases, but the earliest phase uh, is datable to about between 100 BCE and 100 CE. Check out this stone mask. There were stone masks going all the way up both sides of the stairway here. Look at the size of these things. And uh, they're not all here anymore, but uh, back in the day it must have been magnificent. From the terrace level, a central stairway continues to the top, and we ascended. The structure is higher than it looks. Three temple structures top the pyramid. Note that the central temple is the largest, and the adjoining temples face inward towards it. That's a common Maya arrangement. While the front of the temple has been restored, the rear has not. A second stairway from behind the temple leads up to the summit. Not enough to keep me from coming up here. Here in the Northern Plaza, we have the Temple of the Mass pretty amazing. This is one of the earliest buildings here at Lamanai on the northern end. Uh, we think it, the original construction here dates back to about 600 BCE, uh, but it was added to over the years. Here flanking the stairway on either side you see these giant stucco masks. Aren't they amazing? They're just stunning. 13 feet high made out of limestone. And uh, we don't know if this is a god or a human, uh, but he's wearing a crocodile headdress and these were placed here somewhere around 400 CE. Found within the Temple of the Masks was an earlier substructure dating to about 200 BCE. It too contained stucco masks, ones that were made earlier, and a tomb was found within the pyramid. In it was the body of a man, surrounded by all kinds of shell and jade items. He was buried there around 500 CE, but he is as yet unidentified. In the platform terrace of this temple, they found another tomb which belonged to a woman, also unknown. So far, Belize has been really cool. Next time, we're heading further south into Cayo District to the beautiful town of San Ignacio. We'll use that as a home base to see the cool sights of Cajapetch and Caracol. So stick around, there's more to come. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. <laughs>